For my talk today, I want to talk about one of the most fascinating topics in all of astronomy, and that is stellar evolution. For thousands of years, humans thought that unlike ourselves, the stars were constant, they lasted forever. But however, they're actually just like humans in the fact that they go through complicated lifespans. That actually is one of the most fascinating things you can study. However, it is one of the widest fields of astronomy, has so many different types of stars, sizes, that I decided to focus on for the first part of the lecture, the end point of the lifespan of a star. What happens when a star has left what is called the main sequence? And for this type, I'm going to focus on a star of one solar mass, so a sun-like star. Okay. And so, as we know, stars are pattern patterned by what's called nuclear fusion. For thousands of years, we wondered, why do stars shine? Why are they so bright in the sky? And that's because they are fusing hydrogen into helium. Stars are almost completely hydrogen when they're in the prime of their lifespan. And they're using so much and producing so much energy, fusing this hydrogen into helium, producing enormous amounts of light. And so in general, of sort of the star's lifespan, when you build up ash, fusing it for So you have a certain amount of hydrogen throughout a star's lifespan. When a star is born, it has a certain amount of mass, or what we'd call fuel. Sort of like having a certain amount of firewood for your fire. Larger stars burn their wood faster, smaller ones a little bit slower. And so over billions of years for some stars, eventually they build up ash in the core of the helium. Because once this helium is formed, we can't use it anymore for a no last star. We need hydrogen. After that, we slowly build up more and more ash as we get older, more and more helium that we've used up, so more and more burnt firewood. And after you've gotten to a complete core, we have run into a problem. The way stars form is gas clouds collapse to a certain point where it doesn't want to collapse anymore. Your atoms and electrons don't want to become closer. And so you have what's called electron degeneracy pressure. And this pushes back out against the force of gravity. So really, when you look at a star, you are looking at a long-lasting fight between gravity and outward forces. And this is powered by nuclear fusion. That is your outward force. Well, once this is done, you don't have anything to push back out. And so your star is going to try to collapse. Well, as this happens, the more you push in, you're going to get greater resistance. And as this happens, your temperature rises. And eventually, for stars of a certain mass, you might start another phase of fusion. And we'll get into that later in the lecture. And so this increased fusion makes a star, as it gets older and runs out of fuel, balloon out as this temperature rises. Sort of like some humans as they age, if you'd say. <laughs> and also cool in surface temperature. And now if stars... <laughs> <laughs> and so it starts have enough mass, eventually you have enough contraction that you get such a high temperature that this helium ash can reach the critical temperature and start fusing into carbon for a higher mass star. Now the fusion temperature for carbon is about 600 million Kelvin. So when you see the average temperature of the sun being 54 Kelvin, that is not the whole story about the sun's temperature. And so this is the cycle and you either repeat until the end stage is reached or until your star is dead. And so we'll say stage one for a sun-like star of about one solar mass is after you've ran out of your helium, in the center of your sun, you will see a very dense helium ash core and your left of your hydrogen burning shell. Most of your star, however, is actually ve not very dense and not burning. It's mostly in the center core here, which is why you see a surface temperature of about 5,400 Kelvin for the sun. But if you go delve deeper, that changes drastically because you have actual nuclear fusion occurring, which is more powerful than any force we've been able to achieve on Earth. About the size of a pencil tip, you could create the same force as thousands of the bombs on Hiroshima with the end of a pencil, with this reaction. And so, after this happens, the star will expand because almost a third of the star's mass is right in this tiny little spot. Okay. 
And so when this happens, this is because your hydrostatic equilibrium is broken. Remember how I discussed that when a star is in main sequence, you have an equal outward force and inward force. When your helium has formed from your hydrogen, it's not producing any energy because the sun has not yet increased its temperature enough to fuse helium into carbon. And so you start to expand because this core, without fusing and pushing back outwards, tries to contract under the force of gravity. Well, whenever you go to higher temperatures and higher pressures, it's going to create a lot of changes for the star. And so as you raise this core temperature, the rate of fusion of this hydrogen is going to increase and increase and increase drastically. And that increases your outward pressure. And that's what makes your stars expand as a red subgiant. This is what will happen to the sun in about 5 billion years. And so this increased hydrogen shell fusion makes an outward pressure that makes the star expand like a balloon. And being larger, the envelope and your photosphere, the part of the star we can see, cools. And this is why an older star appears red, is all of the objects in the universe have a temperature and radiation relationship. And so as an object is hotter, it's going to burn or emit a shorter wavelength of light. So light is electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves are light. It's a long wavelength of light. And x-rays and gamma rays are also light. So people say, well, stars glow, but we don't. That is absolutely not true. It is all based on what is called the black body curve in physics. And at about the temperature of the sun, you are at the temperature to emit visible light. Actually, mostly in the green spectrum. We only see yellow because we're not so sensitive to green. But that's actually where the sun peaks. However, we humans have a black body spectrum too. We just don't burn at the temperature the sun does, so we emit infrared light. Hence why we use infrared cameras on Earth. If we used ultraviolet cameras on Earth, well, they'd be virtually useless. Almost nothing on our planet is that hot, which is why we want James Webb so bad for planetary studies. Is Hubble is great for stars, nebulae, things like that, but we can't see the little planets that are next to these stars because they just aren't hot enough. And so, as the star increases in size from this outward expansion, the temperature increases about half. And we observe this in almost all stars we see. It's this exact relationship. And there is a diagram called the HR diagram. And this is the result of years of research on stars. We found that as a star ages, depending on its mass and surface temperature and luminosity, we found that all stars follow a certain sequence. The main sequence here is when a star is currently fusing hydrogen into helium. And the sun is right about here right now, one solar radius. And as we go to helium and start to expand, we move to a subgiant. So in about 5 billion years, when the sun reaches its 10 billion year main sequence lifespan, not the entire lifespan, but this main sequence lifespan, it will expand and decrease in temperature as it expands and moves to a subgiant branch. And this is now at stage two of a sun-like star's lifespan. And so, we see some drastic changes already in the luminosity as well. And now the Levinushay tract of this initial horizontal movement is called the subgiant branch. And this is uh, characterized by the hydrogen shell burning with the non-fusing helium mass core that's building up in the center of the star. It's a very, very tiny region compared to the whole star we see. And so right now, you, in luminosity, the lower your number, the higher your luminosity actually is your energy output. So right now, we're in a luminosity class four, and we've expanded to about three to five solar masses in about five billion years. Now what's interesting is while all of these traits change as a star evolves, only one thing determines a star's lifespan and how it will move along this track, and that is the star's initial mass as it forms. A star that has a very, very low mass. We have some stars that we see in the universe that have a lifespan longer than how long the universe has been around. While we have some O stars that are way up in the mass that last for tens of thousands of years that we had never get to observe because the light never reaches us. They're just already gone. And so that's why we don't see many bright stars. So few of those form compared to smaller stars and they just have such shorter lifespans. And so, 
as this process goes on, as we keep on running out of our hydrogen, get a bigger and bigger helium ash core, it continues to contract under gravity. And again, we're going to keep on driving up our temperatures and our reaction rates in this hydrogen burning shell outside the helium burning shell. So as we gain a shell, don't forget about your last shell. It's almost like an onion. It's going to keep on pushing out as you go. And so, again, we get more outward pressure and the star is going to expand even more. Most of the interior becomes completely opaque to radiation and the star becomes convective. And this is, we've about went about 7 billion years from now, if we were the sun. And so after this happens, the temperature becomes nearly constant because we've changed the way we're creating our temperature. It's a little bit different. And the star is still rapidly expanding. So in a few billion years, we went from one solar mass to about a hundred solar masses. A hundred times wider than we are right now. We could say bye-bye solar system at this point. And so we actually could a long time ago. And so now with this expansion, luminosity is actually a squared relationship with your solar radii. So when we decreased it by 10 times, we are now a hundred times more luminous with our radius, luminosity, and temperature relationship in astronomy. And so this rapid expansion with the nearly constant temperature makes the star move almost nearly vertical on our HR diagram. And this is now what we call the red giant branch. And the sun right now is a G2 star. So we're about middle ground in terms of a star and how luminous it can be and how much energy you can put out. At this point, we would be a K or an N3 star. So we've moved down to here, from here. We have changed a lot. And what we find is this graph is so important because no matter where we've seen a star in the universe, if it has a certain mass, it has always followed these relationships. And that was the key to understanding stars in the universe. And so, now we're going to try to create even new elements after we start to find helium. The sun can do this. Even lower stars cannot do this. And so, about eight solar masses is our lower limit. And so when helium core densities reach about 10 to the 8 kilograms per meters cubed and about 100 million Kelvin, now the Caribbean sounds pretty cool, we start to form carbon. The critical temperature of helium fusion is 100 million Kelvin. That's when we start, we can actually move on from hydrogen to helium into helium to carbon. We can continue our star's life cycle. The temperature and density is now high enough within our star to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion between positively charged helium nuclei. And this force is extremely strong. Helium to carbon fusion occurs in two steps. We call this reaction the triple alpha fusion reaction. The reason we call this is we usually call helium alpha particles in physics. And so we start by taking four heliums, we form a brillium and energy. And this comes to use with a very famous equation I'm sure you've all heard of. E equals mc squared. This is actually the mass equivalency equation. Sorry. This has never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the engineers are very. Right. <laughs> just get rid of the <laughs> <laughs> No, it's no problem. <laughs> And so if you notice, while it says it very generally here, we do will find in these reactions that some of the mass is gone. We would notice this wouldn't actually be exactly eight if you looked precisely at the reaction. It'd be a little less than eight. Well, we know that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, so what happened? Einstein figured out the answer. We use E equals mc squared. C being the speed of light, the mass lost from this brilliant times the speed of light will give you the energy produced by this single reaction. So you take the speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and you multiply by your mass lost, and you will find that from just two atoms, you get a significant energy return. And think about the billions and billions and billions of kilograms in a single star and how much that happens per second. It's unimaginable how much energy a star puts out per second, more than the Earth will ever be able to generate in its entire lifespan, in a second. We can never do that with solar panels. And then, we want to get to carbon. 
So we take this beryllium and the energy we found and get another alpha particle, helium, and create a carbon-12, but not quite a carbon-12. Some of this will become energy, which we can actually study this more by the fact that light has momentum with no mass. You see how energy is easily converted from mass. And so we, that's why we call this the triple alpha process. And that is how a star like the sun saves itself from death after running out of hydrogen. And so for stars similar to the mass of the sun or smaller, about less than two and a half solar masses, something funny begins to happen in this helium core. This material enters a new phase called electron degenerate matter. And so far we know solid, liquid, gas, and plasma phases. Well, some weird stuff starts to happen when we hit these temperatures. According to the Pauli exclusion principle, you cannot squeeze electrons with the same turn, so spin, an up and an up. You can put an up and a down together, but no up and ups. You cannot put them in the same volume, which creates a pressure that resists the crust of gravity. Whenever these electrons have no more room to move, you just can't compress, it, compress them any further. And we call this electron degeneracy pressure. And at this point, that is what's resisting our star collapsing on itself, is it's our force pushing outwards. And so, eventually your densities and your temperatures in the core will rise for the 100 million Kelvin for helium to start fusing into carbon. And so this matter is crushed so tightly that even when you start the triple alpha process to form carbon, this rapid spike in temperature still does not make enough thermal energy to break the electron degenerate state. Gravity is just still so strong because this star has so much mass that the electrons are still squeezed together to their maximum. You cannot push them together any tighter. So despite this rapid increase in outward pressure, this time we're not expanding and cooling. We're going to lead to an incredible spike in temperature, which makes our helium start burning like crazy. We now don't have a house fire, we have a wildfire going on in the star, which increases the temperature, and it goes on and goes on and goes on. Think about the runaway greenhouse effect with Venus. This is a stellar version of that. And so your temperatures run away, and over the course of hours, not years, not billions of years, 5 to 10 percent of the helium in this core is going to be carbon. That is instantaneous in terms of the universe. And so what's strange, though, is that we're exerting lots and lots of energy, but we actually find little external change at the star. It doesn't expand like we saw the first time. So what's happening here? Well, we call this the helium flash because it's so, so rapid. And eventually, the electron and density pressure will be broken. And the core will now eventually expand and cool. And you create what is called now a helium flash phase. And so now the helium core is stable again, and the star has saved itself once more. The lifespan of a star is a long fight. And it will continue to fuse helium into carba via the triple alpha process. And we have now entered stage four of a solar mass star's life. This cooler core means a reduction in fusion reaction rates energy produced, which means that our star has now dropped in luminosity, which is why we see it drop in spectral class. And so this is why for large stars, O stars, they start way up here. We wonder why they start up here, so they're going to lose their lifespan much faster. The reason for this is, as you can see this here, the more fuel you have and the more mass you have, the more you speed up this process, which is why stars that are larger die so much faster and so much more violently. There's, I'll go and explain later why the sun will become a dwarf while some stars become black holes, some of the biggest enigmas in the universe. And so right now, we still have our helium burning core, and we still remember, we do still have an outer hydrogen burning shell that hasn't disappeared yet. It's kind of expanding outwards. And so now that we have a cooler core and lower rates of helium fusion after the helium flash, the overall star will shrink. So now we will drop again in luminosity, but our surface temperature will rise. And the star will move down and to the left on the HR diagram. So now we will be on the horizontal branch in a star's life. The star reestablishes hydrostatic equilibrium, because remember what matters this equilibrium is that you are producing helium fusion. No matter what element, you need that fusion. And we're back to this point now. It may not be hydrogen, but it's helium. 
and to the star, no difference as long as we are getting that outward force. And so we're at the triple alpha process. With less helium overall though, this arrow stability is short because there's more mass per helium molecule, so you're going to get less reactions. So only about 10 million years can a solar mass star survive on this horizontal branch compared to 10 billion on the main sequence. We've decreased by orders of magnitude on our lifespan. And so at this stage, it will fall in this horizontal region. And the precise temperature of the star at this point depends on how much mass the star lost on its initial ascent up the red giant branch. Right here, this is a very important step in the star's life for determining its future fate. But all of them have about the same luminosity. And during this red giant branch stage, the strong stellar winds will eject large amounts of mass from the star, up to about 20 to 30 percent of the original mass. And that's huge. And now, with less mass lost, a cooler star, counterintuitively, is further right on the horizontal branch. Right here, you're actually in a better position if you're a lower mass star. And so, similar to the initial ascent up the red giant branch, eventually your carbon ash core builds up just like we did before, and it creates a carbon ash core that cannot fuse because we're not hot enough to fuse carbon yet. And it begins to contract again because we have lost hydrostatic equilibrium once more. And so these core layers again, you now have a carbon ash core. Your helium is still burning, what you have left, because you have reached that temperature and you still have a hydrogen burning shell. And about this core is the non-fusing envelope you have. And if you notice, we start to see some repetition. We had the red giant branch, and now we have what's called the asymptotic giant branch. And it looks quite similar. And if you notice, if we put the red giant branch out to infinity, these would eventually merge together. And so right now, this is what, if we looked at a star and cut it into pieces, this is what we would see. Here is your burning part right here. All of this huge part is inactive. It's actually not burning. And you're at about 100 solar radii. In this middle here, you've got your carbon ash. And here is your helium burning shell. This is what's actually still pushing out. Right here, this carbon ash, it is not producing any outward pressure. And then here's your little bit of hydrogen burning shell. These two shells are the only two things fighting the crush of gravity at this moment. And so right now, the star is losing its battle to live. And so with no outer force, this carbon ash core is going to contract and increase the temperature and density. The more you squeeze, the higher you, your temperature goes. That's how diamonds are formed in the Earth. You increase that temperature and pressure, you're going to form something, and something's going to change. That coal is squeezed into something new. And so as with this red giant branch, the non-fusing envelope again rapidly expands and cools and moves up and slides to the right once again on the HR diagram and this is your asymptotic giant branch and see if you incented the red giant branch to infinity they would eventually meet and so this is now we're going to talk about the end for a low mass star low mass stars have now reached the limit of how hot they can be Low mass stars, less than eight solar masses, do not have enough mass to increase the core temperature to the required carbon fusion temperature of 600 million Kelvin. You would add carbon and carbon to make magnesium, a little less than 24, and energy. But before this critical point is reached, the core will again become electron degenerate and not have enough mass this time to continue increasing core temperatures. And at this point, our sun is about 300 times wider than it was when we lived with it. And now we are at a luminosity class one or two. Nothing compared to what we see now. And so we're way up here now. And so, as the helium and hydrogen shells continue to burn, more mass goes into the ash cores, and the temperature continues to rise. On the boundary between the carbon ash core and the helium shell, though, some interesting things happen. Some of this carbon will produce oxygen. Well, that's weird. These atoms are doing more than we initially thought they would. Well, also these helium burning shells will go through a series of helium shell flashes. So it's going to go bow, bow, bow. The star is just producing masses of energy and it produces large expansion fluctuations in non-fusing envelope. 
and again. This is why we think that star deaths are good things because with these outward expulsions comes the pressure needed to hit other clouds of dust and with the death of this star will come the birth of new ones, many more than itself. And so as they expand and cool and contract again, we start the process all over again. And so each of these oscillations or these bursts will grow in strength until the outer layers decouple from the core and expand away from the star at speeds of tens of kilometers per second. This high velocity creates what's shock waves and it starts new rounds of star formations. And that's why you see in the Milky Way, you see where the large mass stars have been, the arms are actually not just because there were arms there. It's because there was so much stellar mass there as these short-lived stars die. They press out and make so much new stars become born. And that's why these are just stellar nurseries. And there's also a reason why there are more stars than galaxies. Because what's in the middle of a galaxy is a black hole. And we'll expand why there's so many less of those than the big bright stars we see in the sky. And so as it expands, it goes cooler and redder, but contracts hotter and cooler. And so now, as this happens, as the star oscillates, it's the last steps of life, it becomes what's called a variable star. And we start to see these crazy curves come from these stars as they are dying. And so now, we come to the end of a low mass star's life. Before we understood what formed these, we called them planetary nebulae because it looks similar to early scientists of what formed a new solar system, the protoplanetary disk. Because they would assume from these processes that you'd form a sphere, spherical core, but we find out this is not always the case. And so during each pulsation, part of the star is losing mass. The sun is also losing mass by solar flares and other things, but not at all compared to this here. So we're exposing hotter and deeper layers. As you push out, you're digging farther into the star, which is why we see the bright centers of nebulae with fainter, beautiful fading outer edges. And eventually, the core separates from this pulsating outer envelopes, and it becomes exposed to space. And it has a surface temperature up to a few hundred thousand Kelvin, hot enough to emit ample amounts of ionizing UV photons. And this is the key to creating the beautiful nebulae we observe through our telescopes. These photons ionize the escaped shells of gas that are going outside of the star, and they cause them to glow through the emission light as the electrons fall to lower excited states. The same process that creates the aurora borealis. They rise into another state which requires energy. And then they jump down and emit the energy they gain. It always has to be the exact same amount that you took to jump up. And so this is our stage six of a star's lifespan called the planetary nebula. The exposed inner portions are actual star. The sun becomes a white dwarf. And the expanding shells of fluorescent gas that are once the outer layers of the spar are the beautiful formations we see outside of that bright dwarf center. And so what we see is something really interesting once we reach the stage. Our star starts to zing all around. The HR diagram, it's not this pretty pattern anymore, decided to go on a little field trip. And so planetary nebulae is just a historical leftover. As outer shells of non-fusing envelope escape, they expose the hotter layers underneath again, which creates this huge jump in temperature, which makes it move left on our HR diagram. We see this for every single planetary nebula. And as we continue to expose hotter blue rays, we keep on booming out these new layers. We now see the central star is emitting mostly an ultraviolet. And these expanding shells start to glow too. And so the increased surface temperature balances out with a smaller size. So it remains relatively constant in luminosity. And now the star is finally stabilized in its lifespan. And so now we'll talk a little bit more about the final stage of a star's life, a low mass star. The original expectation was that this would always happen evenly in the same direction, which of course with original thoughts, it would make sense for that. However, that is not at all the norms. Abel 39 is actually a convenient example of that. But do we see many of these? Absolutely not. This is a very rare example of the white dwarf right in the middle. So it's hot yet dead central white dwarf star. It is actually completely dead. It is only glowing 
because of the temperature left over from what's happened before. And then outside you have this expanding shell of gas. And what you see is the shell because at these edges you see it with a sound wave. As you move forward it's going to build up at the outer edges and that's what we see most of. And so if we say Earth is this way, we're going to see this big line here. So the star is absolutely tiny compared to the nebula. That's why it took us a bit to understand why these actually form. It's before we had these incredible telescopes, we couldn't see the little star right in the middle. We thought they were just like the protoplanetary disks that we'd seen. And so now we see that this ring is not at all what always happens when we have planetary nebulas. Due to asymmetric winds when the star moves, this is not a completely just uniform process. The magnetic fields in the sun are absolutely crazy. Nothing about a star is uniform. In the way, but we used to think they are perfect heavenly bodies. That is not so. Binary companions. Stars orbiting each other, making gravitational variations. Close orbiting gas giant exoplanets. Jupiter. Other physical processes. Almost all planetary nebulae are much more complicated in shape and stunning in appearance. Depending on the temperatures, you can get all sorts of colors and emission lines. H alpha is this reddish color. It is 656.3 mil nanometers and it is this common color here that is one of the most useful lines we ever need in astronomy. If you want to break into one of our computers, put in that number. <laughs> Here's another example. So these are just the beautiful types of nebulae we see. That's just a small sample, the hourglass nebula. NG New General Context 2438. Again, we do have that more that ring structure, but almost looks like an eye. Like a, as you see a Z here, there's so many different things, and it's beautiful. And so there's just there's no one formula to how star goes, just like humans. There's no one formula to live life. That's not the case for a star either. The red spider nebula, beautiful. The butterfly nebula, and so these was a bigger star. So you see how we had different colors. That's a different life, different types of element balance and temperature than the sun has or the stars have. The cat's eye nebula, a very famous nebula. The red rectangle nebula. And this is a little bit of an extra tidbit before I start the last part on my second PowerPoint. We talked a little bit about a helium flash. So stellar modeling of the helium flash estimated that the point of the flash, 40% of the mass of the star was in that little bitty helium core. That's how much the density of this star was focused. And 6% of the core was converted to carbon instantaneously. And as you can imagine, this produces an incredible amount of energy, roughly equivalent to the velocity of all the stars in the Milky Way at once. However, nearly all this energy goes into converting the core from degenerate to non-degenerate matter, resulting in an expanded and cooled core. Similar to the fact that if you want to change ice to water, you hold your hand on the cup, the temperature does not change because all of your energy is going into sta changing the state of matter, not to the temperature at this point. Same thing is happening at this point in the helium flash. And so this is the first part of my lecture and I'll go ahead and put up the second part. So we talked a little bit about lower mass stars. Well people always love to hear about the big stars. What happens what are black holes from? And this is actually the result of black holes. Gravitational lenses. Whoops, go back. And so as we see, we one time found a smiley face. We find some cute stuff in astronomy. You see these beautiful spiral galaxies. These right here are actually behind the black hole. It has bent space time so much that we see things that are actually behind. We proved this with the solar eclipse Many, many years ago, we proved that this was true. So, now we're going to go down the rabbit hole and talk about general relativity, black holes, and neutron stars, the result of high mass stellar dust. So, we've seen from the first lecture that gravity will always win the one force, which is actually not really a force, but the one force that a star fights is gravity. Throughout its entire life, everything fights gravity. That's why we couldn't live on Jupiter besides the atmosphere. If it was just like Earth, we'd be crushed. Just gravity. And so, at approximately greater than three mass of the Sun, where we talked about the first lecture was about 
one to 2.5 solar masses. That was about what we were discussing with that process. At about three mass of the suns or greater, gravity, after a sun has went through all of its future, after all of its phases, gravity will overcome neutron degeneracy pressure. Neutron degeneracy pressure. Every atom has neutrons, and they only want to get so close together. We all have our personal bubble. They do too. And they don't want to get closer than that. Well, at this point, gravity is so strong, it says, well, you better scoot in because we're in a crowded class today. And so, while we have this element, we still don't know for certain if that is the mass because the magnetic field rotation of things kind of can change things in these extreme conditions. But at this high mass rate, a neutron star is gaining mass, or the merge of two stars, we start to see crazy things happen with neutron energy pressure. In a high mass star, we can say the original stellar mass is expected to be greater than 20, 25 mass of the sun to create a three solar mass neutron star. So that is how much we have condensed from gravity at this point. And so, we are now at this point, if we get to this point, we're going to break that neutron degeneracy pressure that holds a neutron star. The reason neutron stars are so, so isolated is their gravitational pull, their bend in space-time is so strong that nothing can be close to it because it has such a strong tidal force. Tidal forces is why, of course, we have tides, but it's also why we only see one phase in the moon. We have tidally locked the moon, but that doesn't only happen between the Earth and the moon. It is actually a force, or a differential force. And what it is, is gravity, the closer you are to an object, the stronger the attraction is. And so, if you have an object of certain mass, gravity is weaker here than over here. And so the moon is actually pulled more on this end than the back end, and so it's a stretching force. Well, the reason we don't see anything near a neutron star is this tidal force is so strong, it rips apart anything within light years. That is also why Saturn has these beautiful rings. You know, so there's no large moons inside those rings. Titan is oddly far away from Saturn because if it got any closer, it's large enough, Saturn would eat it alive because the difference in gravity takes a force will just tear it to pieces. This is what happens with neutron stars. And with your higher densities, the gravitational force is so strong, we just we couldn't survive. If there was a neutron star within a parsec of our solar system, we'd be feeling it. And we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have five more billion years. <laughs> and so, now, that is right beneath your black hole. And so if you get too much mass on a neutron star, you have now just about broken physics. The result of this is the ever-famous black hole. And a strange, it's a strange object where light can't even overcome its gravity. And so a black hole is the ultimate end to a star's lifespan. Gravity always wins. No matter how much mass you have, you will lose to gravity if you're a star. There is no way around. Absolutely everything. And so what was neat is that we found this was the absolute certainty of what we have observed. And there are no known forces left to stop this crush of gravity. Nothing can stop it. Nothing we've observed. And so what does it collapse or when does the collapse stop? Well, this question really pushes what we know so far. We have in a black hole what is called the singularity. We have said that our mass, if we break the neutron energy pressure, we're basically saying that our atoms are condensing into nothing, which means our mass over our volume, we're putting all this mass over zero volume, which means your density is infinity, and we call this the singularity. However, there is still a question of how much we know about this singularity, because this is beyond what we understand right now in physics. And so, is there something that could eventually collapse? What would happen if the force was overcome? These are big questions. And so, as you shrink, making gravity near it stronger and stronger, your density keeps increasing, the force required to overcome it 
eventually becomes unsurpassable. And so we don't quite all know what's going on. Right now, this is our understanding of gravity, our equation. And so consider collapsing all of that mass. The minimum required to make a neutron star is three solar masses, which if you create an unstable one, you can make a black hole. Into a single point, it's called a singularity. Well, what does that mean? Well, to a single point, that means some strange things. It means some things really change the way we evaluate in physics. It means you now have no more up and down. No more left and right, forward and back. Our 3D spatial dimensions are gone. We have gone one dimension, and the distance has gone to zero. We cannot create that anywhere else in the universe. We cannot study it. And so there's no more volume, which means your density equals your mass over volume becomes infinite, which makes no sense in terms of what we understand. We broke, we broke space. As the distance goes to zero, the force of gravity also becomes instant. That also doesn't make sense. Forces are meant to be measurable. So we, we, broke, we broke physics too. We messed up really bad. As we will soon see, though, due to Einstein's theory of relativity, things actually start to become even weirder. As you approach a black hole, time stops, too. We broke time. <laughs> Doctor Who's mad at us. <laughs> so <laughs> what is really going on? We don't know. We're in the dark. It is very unlikely that this is an incorrect view, though. And there is some unknown physics that prevents these breakings. It's very, very unlikely. Physics is really the only constant in the universe. Hmm. It is the one thing that you can always trust. Not, 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 not politicians. Trust physics. <laughs> don't, don't trust your friend in the chemistry lab. I learned that the hard way. Trust physics. <laughs> we have also crunched and everything down to an incredibly small space. And the world of the incredibly small is understood not by relativity, but by quantum mechanics. A new field in science that we is so exciting for us to be studying now. Quantum mechanics and its discrete and indeterminate nature cannot explain the smooth continuum of so-called space-time, or the realm of relativity. Physicists right now are working on the solution of a physics of the smallest discrete units of space, a combination of relativity and quantum mechanics called quantum gravity. This is the frontier of human understanding. So we don't know much, but what do we know? We need to, we need to leave behind classical physics. To understand the things that are outside of our realm on Earth, we need to go beyond that understanding. Newton, unfortunately, has to take the bench for this one. And we now have to look towards Einstein. We have to go a little bit more than M. We get to look a little bit more than mass for this. And so as we go into a single point, we're going to lose our dimensions and change our thinking points. And so <laughs> earlier this semester, I borrowed this from my first year class. I got permission for it because I wanted you to see how we present this to first year students. So I fused my own slides with some of my professors. And as you see, that's how we kept our attention when we were tired in the morning. And so we had to discuss escape speed. Before we got into the intense mathematics that I now study, I had to learn it this way. I had to learn the basics before you could go farther along with it. And so escape speed. It's the speed required to escape the gravitational field of an object, planet, star, neutron star, black hole. We also discussed that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. That is the universe's speed limit. There's nothing faster. There's also something that we see that's very weird about that, is we have to use special relativity. And we will discuss gravity absolutely does affect light. We saw that with the introductory picture to this lecture. The gravitational lens shows that light itself, even though it has no mass, is still affected by space-time. However, it starts to make more sense whenever we delve into the fact that light still has momentum. You have to be affected by space-time itself to have momentum. Otherwise, you cannot interact. And so, light is subject to the rules of gravity just like everything else, which is a principle of general relativity. And so, this, we use this, for Earth, if you want to find the escape velocity. However, right now we're trying to find out about black holes. And light cannot escape a black hole. So if you want to find 
where the escape velocity of light is. We can algebra that equation. We can math it and get this right here. I wish I still did that equation. And so light cannot escape from a black hole, hence we call it a black hole. As the core collapses toward a smaller and smaller size of our dead star that is no longer being fighting against gravity, it just has so much mass, nothing's breaking this force. What you think? Gravity is actually one of the weakest forces in the universe. Think about the mass needed to make that force so strong that atoms cannot even hold apart from it. Earth is actually, even though it's thousands of kilometers in diameter, is still exerting a very weak force on us. Relative, we can rub a balloon on our hair and we stick it on the wall and that's stronger than gravity. Magnitude stronger than the gravitational force. It's static. It's a very weak force by nature. However, the star was so massive that it has now broken everything else. Nothing could stop it. That it perhaps goes infinitely small to a singularity. And so when we think about this, we now need to consider, well, when is the black hole black? When is the escape speed equal to the speed of light? That has to be a reason why we cannot see anything out of a black hole. Well, obviously, we only see through light. The reason we can't observe a black hole is we see everything in astronomy through light. That is how we observe. If we don't get any light back, we can't see a thing. And so, closer to the black hole, the escape speed becomes larger and larger and larger. Just like we, if we jumped, we have no hope of escaping Earth's orbit. But you go up and up and up, that force becomes a little bit smaller as you go away. So that's why asteroids going much slower than 13,500 kilometers per second don't have to go as fast as the space shuttle. It's farther away. And so, eventually, we have calculated a distance away from a black hole where not even light can escape. And we call this the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole. And the way we found this equation is we took our conventional escape velocity equation, which we use the gravitational constant, big G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. That's the magnitude of that constant of the universe. Gravity always has that intrinsic strength. Times the mass of our object. And the radius to the square root gives us the escape velocity. Well, we want our escape velocity to be c. The universe's speed limit, because nothing can go faster. So we put c into here. 2gm over r. Well, now we can find our radius by manipulating this equation. So our Schwarzschild radius, the distance away from the single center of a black hole, is found with this equation. 2 times big G times your mass of your star. Remember that stays constant. You still use that over the speed of light squared. Is the exact distance away from which not even light can escape the black hole. And so we model this in astronomy almost like we model our constellations. We model the same way. It has a clear globe. This right here is your Schwarzschild radius. And now you expand that. Take this radius and create a globe around your black hole. This globe now defines what is called the event horizon. That is the absolute limit of what we can observe of a black hole. That is the last bits of light that is there. And so this calculated distance is the Schwarzschild radius. And now, let's think about this. Inside this boundary, this disk is huge compared to the singularity. Huge. Not even light can escape this. And this little bitty singularity is responsible for all of that. Outside this boundary, it's not trapped yet. The light can still get away. However, it will be severely bent. It is being very affected by the black hole, but it can still escape. And after we reach the event horizon, all information is lost at this point. We cannot observe any farther. And so now we'll go to Einstein's theory of relativity. In the extremely high densities of neutron stars and black holes, as well as the extremely high velocities, we can no longer rely on Newton's laws of motion and universal gravity. Anything faster than a speed of one-tenth 
the speed of light, or 0.1c, is considered a relativistic object. Momentum. You cannot calculate momentum as mass times velocity anymore. You have to include gamma. You have to change everything you use to calculate once you reach this threshold. And so, we had to develop the theory of relativity. And we saw that what our past understanding was, was not a, sufficient for this. And so, there were two theories. It was special relativity and general relativity. And Einstein, everything he learned, he credits to what he calls thought experiments. It was where he didn't go to a lab quite so much, you'd say. What he would do is he would sit and just think and imagine. And if you ask him what he said, he would say, I have no special talents. I was only passionately curious. That's what matters in learning more about the universe is not the IQ. It is how creative in our, how you are and how brave you are and how imaginative you are. And that's what he says. And so he also says that motion is relative. Think of <coughs> physics now in terms of circumstances. There is not one frame of reference. And that's one of the largest things we had to learn to understand. Everything requires us to understand from this point on frame of reference. It's all relative. And so a frame of reference is simply the place an observer is making observations. Either you're in a plane or you're on Earth. So these are all examples of observation points. And so, oh, wait a minute. There we go. Okay. And so what he says in his first principle of relativity is that all motion is relative. There is no special reference frame and there's no absolute reference frame that sets a universal standard. However, while that varies, the speed of light is constant no matter your reference frame. And so it is always 299,299,792,458 meters per second. Always, always, always. And so let's think about this for a second. Light is always the same even when your reference point changes. So consider this. Someone is watching a car moving 100 kilometers per hour. He's observing from the side. The driver shoots a bullet at 1,000 kilometers per hour. Well, the observer sees the combination of these reference points, 1,100 kilometers per hour. However, when we use the speed of light, this ship is moving at one-tenth the speed of light, and it shoots a light beam. Well, by the logic up here, he should see a little bit higher than the speed of light. However, that is not the case. The observer only sees C. And so Einstein thought of this in terms of an elevator. And we're going to use a spaceship for this one. He goes, why not? So the consequence of an invariant C is as you move faster, time begins to slow down. So let's say you're moving at 86% the speed of light. An observer outside the spaceship can see you. They're at no motion compared to you. You are moving this fast compared to them. And so the astronaut sees the laser go straight up and down. He shoots a laser, goes up and down. However, the observer has seen a dilation. Longer total travel distance. The light, however, still traveled at sea. So we see a longer period of time observed. Time has been dilated for this observation to take longer. We see a long beam. We do not see an up and down like the astronaut sees. We see a dilation and it looks like time slows down and the exact number can be found by this equation. And so we see this in black holes. That is one of the most amazing things that happens in black holes eventually. Whenever we reach C, time stops completely. So if you watch somebody fall into a black hole, you will never see them fall in. It would freeze at the event horizon. You would stare at them forever because time would freeze until you looked away and changed your reference point. It is all relative. And so we realized special relativity by this thought experiment. We live in at least four dimensions, three space and one time. 
Do not consider them independently. It is not space and time. It is space time. What you say in physics is matter energy tells space time how to bend, but it goes the other way around too. Matter energy and space time. Space time tells matter energy how to move. So it's a relationship both directions. They are dependent. And so the time for an event to take place depends on what reference frame it is observed from. So if you're observing from a relatively fast reference frame, time appears to run slower, or so-called time dilation, which is taken to the extreme when you're going through the extreme bend in space or black hole. This is taken to the absolute extreme. So for things moving faster than you, the clock moves slower. We see this happen. For time dilation difference, we see this in momentum. Gamma becomes very familiar when you start using relative objects. You observe time moving in a reference frame difference. We call it the Lorentz factor. That's how we use to measure dilations. And so the way we can see this is think of the twins paradox. This is one of the first things you So this would absolutely happen. Consider two 20-year-old identical twins. Our astro astronauts. One hops into a spaceship that travels at 0.999 c, almost the speed of light. Anything besides light, because light is energy, cannot reach c. So she gets as close as she can get, travels to a star 30 light years away, does a dance, runs back to Earth. A twin waited about 60 years, 30 light years there, 30 back. She's 80. However, while time feels like it flows normally for the spaceship twin, in her reference frame, from the Earth reference frame, time has been slowed by a factor of fall, this is the question, 22.36 times. So she has only aged by about three years, and she is just slightly younger than 23 years old. Time absolutely has moved slower for her. And so, because we cannot flip-flop the situation that Earth is moving away. No, because it happens in acceleration. You cannot reverse. And so. And that was what he really wanted to understand was gravity. And so most of it, it rests on the equivalence principle. There's no way to tell the difference in accelerating reference frame and gravity. And so this came understood by the elevator thought experiment. These two subjects have no idea which situation they're in. Because gravity is actually not a force the same way electromagnetism is or anything else like that. We can see that by it's only a positive force. Gravity is mainly an acceleration perception of a bend in space-time. It is actually not an acting force like electromagnetism is, which is why it doesn't have two directions. So that's why we see no difference in the two. He is accelerating. It feels exactly the same as gravity. They are the same. And so we see this. And so um, now we've warped space-time in our brains. <laughs> And so the genius of this was, the situation must really be the same thing. Gravity is not an attractive force caused by mass. It is rather mass's effect on the universe is to warp the fabric of space-time itself. We see this in the coin machines in the mall. Right, it goes around the middle and eventually falls in. It had friction, things like that, but it wasn't, it was just gravity falling down. Orbit. It is actually the same thing, but take away friction, air is all those things. It's falling, but never hitting the ground. We are actually spinning around the bend. That's all we're doing. We're not being pulled by the sun. We're falling, but going just the right speed to stay up. And so, we now see the relationship here. Mass energy tells space-time how to bend. Space-time tells matter energy how to move. And so, as this warp becomes more extreme, we see the clocks become slower. As you get far away, it becomes faster. And so, now we see evidence one, gravitational lenses. Mass warps space-time and light, and it will follow the curvature. So if all this is right, light must bend around massive objects, and it does. We first confirmed this by the total solar eclipse of 1916. We saw things directly behind the sun we shouldn't have seen.
unless this was true. And so now gravitational lensing is routinely observed. This is absolutely a single galaxy that has been warped by space-time. There we go. The bend in space-time makes it move. The light, you don't see the star. You see the light produced by the star. This light kind of bends over. And so the second piece of evidence is GPS. As you go farther away, at about 20,200 kilometers, you have a faster reference frame or slower time from velocity time dilation. Higher altitude is faster time for gravitational time dilation. So for GPS to work, it must account for and correct for both of these to match the clocks in our phones. One day, without general relativity, we would be about off by about 10 kilometers. So 10 days, you want to go to Jackson, you might end up in Nashville. And so now this would be the illustration of the sun. That's about the same relativistic diagram, how much it bends space. Black hole, boom. you would never see the bottom. And so that's why light cannot escape. Light can easily go whoop right around that little bend, but there's no way it's going to get out of that. And so time is warped with this space. And so now we're saying we're traveling towards a black hole again. At the event horizon, gravity is so strong it has broken space-time by warping it to the point where space and time break down and no longer behave the way we understand. Gravitational time dilation slows in higher gravity and at the event horizon, since your escape speed is c, the speed limit of the universe, time stops. And so if you were to watch someone fall towards a black hole from a very, very safe distance, lots of parsecs away, as they get closer to the event horizon, you would see them fall slower and slower as your reference frame compared to theirs changes. And as they reached the event horizon boundary, time would stop as observed from your reference frame and you would never see them fall in. Also, gravity stretches wavelengths of light. So as a star moves away, it's always see redder light. As a planet moves closer, we see bluer light, red shift and blue shift. However, it's so extreme that light would have an infinite wavelength and would therefore not be detectable. So if you want to watch them fall, you have to constantly tune your device to see longer and longer wavelengths of light until eventually it reach infinity. So now we're to go back to tidal forces. Ever heard of spaghettification? <laughs> well, absolutely what happened. As you feel your feet stretched away from your head, the force from the, if I'm going this way towards a black hole, the gravity is stronger here than up here. And so as that difference becomes higher in magnitude, as you get closer, eventually my feet is feeling a lot more force than my back is, and I'm going to fall in faster with my feet than with my head. And I become stretched just like the little poor moons and Saturn's rings. And so this stretching and thinning is called Spaghettification. Well, what happens if you cross the event horizon? Well, we don't really know, but Einstein's equation tells us something strange happens with space, and you can only move forward. Equations of relativity also allow for space time to fold back on itself, forming what is called an Einstein Rosen bridge. It's theoretically possible, but we still have lots of questions if this actually happens in observation. So, <laughs> There you go. Happy Friday. <laughs> and that is the end of my lecture. <laughs>